Hi, I just bought myself a cell phone signal booster. In this video, I'm going to give you my honest opinion on how well it works. The cell phone reception in my neighborhood is very poor. Even though I am only less than a couple of miles from the nearest tower, I barely get one bar in my house. And the only place I get 4G signal is a few spots upstairs in my bedroom. And the signal is too weak for doing anything meaningful. The issue is that we have a lot of tall trees in the area, and they attenuate radio signals quite significantly. And the rolling hills only make the situation quite a bit worse. Now, you might ask why I would need a cell phone signal booster when I could just use Wi-Fi for my phone calls and internet connection. You are absolutely correct. For most of the part, I do just that. But if the internet service goes out, I would be out of luck. I remember the few times that we had extended network outage due to severe weather over the past couple of years. And during the outages, trying to connect to a website usually means having to drive around and find a place where the signal is stronger. Of course, nowadays everyone is working from home, myself included. So the internet connectivity becomes even more critical than before. And that's the main reason I invested in a cell signal booster. So that if the regular internet service does go out, I can tether my computer to my phone for network connectivity to ensure work is not interrupted. Now, after some extensive research, I settled on Nextivity's Cellfi Go X signal booster. And the main reason is that it has a maximum gain of 100 decibels. The maximum gain a booster can have is strictly regulated by the FCC. Most signal boosters that cover the entire cell phone spectrum shared by different carriers can only have a maximum gain of less than 80 decibels according to FCC Part 20.21, which regulates cell phone signal boosters. The way Cellfi Go X gets around this is that at any given time, it only amplifies the bands for a given cell carrier. Products like this have to go through rigorous conformance testing and obtain FCC certifications. And that's one of the reasons why these commercial signal boosters are so expensive. This Cellfi Go X, for instance, costs more than $900. Now let's proceed to some limited teardowns. The reason I say limited is because I bought this unit myself and I do intend to use it, so I don't want to accidentally damage it. This unfortunately means that I won't be able to show you the entirety of the RF sections, as without doing some extensive desoldering, I would not be able to do so. In the meantime though, I am trying to get in contact with the manufacturer to see if they can send me an engineering sample unit for the full teardown purpose. And if I do get my hands on one, I will be sure to post another video on that. Let's first take a look at the indoor dome antenna. This is a broadband antenna that covers from 698 megahertz all the way up to 2700 MHz. This is essentially a modified monocone antenna and the circular metal cover at the base serves as a ground plane. This antenna is vertically polarized and obviously it is omnidirectional given its symmetrical nature. The high bandwidth is achieved using the graduated cylindrical cross-section construction here. The outdoor antenna is a wideband LPDA antenna. LPDA stands for Log Periodic Dipole Array. I wasn't able to open this one as it was sealed at the end, but you can easily find pictures online. LPDAs are sometimes confused with Yagi's as they look pretty similar, but the main difference is that in an LPDA, all elements are actively driven, and its wideband attributes to 
the different length of the dipole arrays. Whereas for a typical Yagi antenna, there is only a single driven element. All the directors and reflectors are passive. Yagi antenna also has a very narrow bandwidth. Now, moving on to the main signal booster unit. The case is made of anodized aluminum, and you can see the extruded fins for heat dissipation. So this entire unit is passively uh, dissipated. The enclosure is uh, NEMA 4 and IP66 rated, which means it is intended for outdoor insulation. Of course, in my case, I'd rather just install it inside the house. By the way, the top cover is actually plastic. As you will see later, this is because the unit has a built-in Bluetooth module, so it cannot be fully shielded. Anyway, there does not seem to be any temper-proof stickers at the bottom, so I think I can safely remove the screws and take a peek inside. Cell phone signal boosters are strictly regulated, as rogue devices can easily overwhelm the entire neighborhood and cause service interruptions. Some cheap eBay boosters are simply just broadband signal amplifiers, which amplify a relatively wide frequency spectrum indiscriminately, and they typically do not have the required low SNR for weak signal amplifications. Keep in mind that your typical received signal power is in the nano to picowatts range. An amplifier not specifically designed for this kind of a weak signal could easily make matter worse by drowning the useful signals in noise and possibly jamming the base stations nearby. In the United States, you are required by FCC regulations to register the booster you're using with your cell phone carriers prior to use. Now we have all the screws removed. Let me flip it over and we will open it up and take a look. And as you can see here, as I mentioned before, the top cover is made of plastic with metal screw inserts for the machined screws. You probably can just make it out from this angle that there is an O-ring around the edges of the case as it is NEMA 4 rated for outdoor use. I went ahead and removed the two shooting cans on either end. These are molded brushed aluminum cans. Clearly cost was not a primary concern for the designers given the molded case and the shielding enclosures. Unfortunately, I am not able to tear this down further without having to start desoldering but we can already see a few key things about this signal booster. And combined with the information in the datasheet, we can have some general ideas. First is that it uses a very high quality PCB, and judging by the layer markings down on the board, I'm assuming this is at least a six layer board or even an eight layer board. A six or more layer board typically has a power layer and either one or two dedicated ground plane in its inner layers, which makes it ideal for RF applications, where reducing signal interference is critical. And for these RF boards, there are typically transmission lines and co-planner waveguides etched in these inner signal layers. As mentioned earlier, this booster is intelligent in the sense that it doesn't just blindly amplify signals within the carrier-specific cell phone frequency bands. I tested this earlier by feeding in a very weak 751 MHz carrier signal, which is in the downlink center frequency of channel 13, that was generated from my HP 8642B, and confirmed that there was no signal output from the repeater. This means that it has to first detect and confirm that this 4G signal was present before it amplifies, rather than blindly amplifying any in-band signals. Here are a few details from the product datasheet. 
For instance, it has advanced digital echo cancellation and channel select filtering algorithms, and has automatic gain control based on real-time echo cancellation, adaptive signal equalization, so on and so forth. All these are achieved using Nextivity's ASIC. It also has a linear RF front end. This is important as linear RF front end helps eliminate intermodulation distortion which improves signal quality. In this kind of uh, signal boosters, echo cancellation is key. Without it, some of the amplified signal would get picked up again by the antenna, and it would easily create a positive feedback loop and jamming the signal, making the signal booster useless. Note that the echo cancellation needs to be applied to both uplink and downlink signals, which are on different frequencies within a given frequency band. This GoX booster also has two sets of radios, one for sending and receiving in the lower bands, such as band 5 and 13, these are sub 1 GHz bands, and the other radio is for the higher frequency bands such as band 2 and 4, which are around 2 GHz frequency range. Because an ASIC is used in this product, I'd assume there's some kind of digital filtering implementation. For instance, matched filters for the echo cancellation. With the shielding cans removed, you can see that there are roughly three sections. Towards the left, that is the RF section for the outdoor antenna side. On the right hand side, a similar RF section is for indoor antenna side. In the middle section, there is some DC to DC converter circuitry towards the top, and then there are two shielded cans. One can might be for the Bluetooth, and the other presumably is for the ASIC processing circuitry. And here you can see a close-up picture of the PCB antenna for the Bluetooth module. Let's take a closer look at the RF section on the outdoor antenna side. The most prominent feature is this uh, Sonics antenna module. I can't find any data sheet for this module, but given that cell signals are fully duplex, meaning that sending and receiving happening at the same time. This module could be a duplexer. And from this angle, you can see some impedance matching business going on inside this antenna module. I couldn't find any information on the SMD chips seen here, but uh, the, the ones with six pins could be saw filters, and the larger black chip could be some kind of amplifier chip. This is just my guess, of course. The circuitry on the indoor antenna side is quite similar to that in the other RF section. The antenna module here is positioned on an angle, presumably to maximize RF isolation. And we see similar soldering patterns on both sides of the RF sections. Not entirely sure what these are, but it could be for heat sinking purpose for the RF power amplification devices on the other side. Again, that's just my guess, without taking the board out. It does make sense though, as the heat sink fins are on the other side of the case. Now let's take a look at the app that controls the GoX signal booster. The app can be downloaded from the App Store, and uh, if you uh, open up the app, it actually communicates with the booster via Bluetooth. And it's pretty impressive at how far the cell phone can be away from the booster and still able to control it. I'm right now in my basement and the booster itself is mounted two floors above me. Now the obvious con to that is since there is no password protection, anyone with this Wave app can control your booster and its operations settings if he or she is close enough to your house. So I think an option to add a password protection would be more prudent. 
And another thing I wanted to point out is this app is actually not rated very high. And the main reason I saw online is that there's no way to exit this app. In fact, the only way you can exit it, I tried, is you, you can use this uh, exit, for instance, and there's no manual option to exit it either. The only way is to kill it. So you have to go here and close all. But of course, that's not very convenient. So there's something that uh, they still need to improve upon. And uh, so here we're greeted with this uh, status uh, page. And I'm going to go through each of the options uh, very quickly so that you get an idea of what this app does. So now let's go to the settings. And here you can see we have operator and currently selected as Verizon. And you can select amongst many of these uh, carriers. Now, the reason I mentioned why we limited one carrier at a time is really not a technical limitation. It's purely by FCC regulation. Because the uh, this Cellfi amplifies signal up to 100 decibels, and uh, the only way it gets around the limitation is to limit by one carrier at a time, which actually is what exactly what I want because I'm at a place where the cell reception is really poor. So I wanted as much amplification as possible. And uh, let's see what else is the booster name. We don't really care. And uh, self version. Uh, oh, by the way, this is automatically updated. So if you open it up, it uh, detects a newer version. It would automatically download and uh, uh, copy it onto the firmware. And then you have this uh, ant antenna settings and under which you have antenna position test. And this is actually very useful when setting up your antenna because you can record at up to eight positions the different signal strength and pick up which one uh, points to the strongest signal direction, which I use this, by the way, to uh, set up the antenna. And now we come down to booster settings. And interestingly, you can see this uh, we do have two modes, one mobile, one stationary. And what I know is that Cellfi uh, Go has two different versions. One is Go M, which is for mobile. One is Go X, which is station, stationary. Now, as far as I can tell, the only difference between that is the max, maximum amplification for the stationary is 100 decibels. For the uh, mobile, I think it's a I can't remember if it's 75 or 80 decibels. Now, interestingly, you can switch these around. I, in fact, I tried this before. And what really happens is if you select mobile, it will reflash the firmware uh, belonging to that mobile version onto your device. And uh, we have many, many bands we can select from and to be able to amplify. The reason I only selected 13 is that uh, sometimes I notice um, the phone actually doesn't really care which signal is stronger. Sometimes it picks up the weaker one if I have multiple enabled. Unfortunately, in my neighborhood, the only strong signal comes in is from this uh, band 13. Um, but as I will show you a little bit later, we can enable other radios. Uh, in fact, this unit has two sets of radios and it can pick up uh, one higher frequency uh, band and one lower frequency band simultaneously. So if you want to drill into a little bit more detail, you can see the channel settings here. And again, we have this uh, band 13 selected with a central frequency of 751 megahertz. So now let's uh, move to the uh, advanced tab. And uh, here, let me show you some of the important features. Uh, by the way, so right now you can see that we're only using one radio and radio B is uh, not used. So let's actually go back. I wanted to show you one thing is right now you can see we have four bars, but uh, um, I wanted to show you that this in action. So let me come back here and uh, let's, uh, let's just for the moment select band two to let it uh, be selected. So what is gonna happen is here, you will see that both sides are started to rescan. And now actually the radio is turned off. So you can see right now I only have one bar. That's because the signal strength is being averaged. So here in my basement, actually, I don't have any reception at all. So hopefully this will drop out re relatively soon. So let's wait for one second while it is scanning. And we'll see that 
right now we indeed do not have any 4G reception. Uh, right now the bar is gone. So let's just wait. And hopefully, let's just see if it drops out. Of course, I can always just turn off the radio to show you that, but I think this will give you long enough. Yep. So now you can see that the signal is dropped off. So it's an X here. So there's no signal. So basically, that's uh, the situation I mean without this booster in my basement. There's no signal at all. But it will scan for a while. And while it's scanning, I will show you some of the uh, uh, what is it trying? What are some of the parameters here? So you can see that we have the bandwidth, uh, with the download central frequency, and upload central frequency. And how this booster works is it transmits and receives on two separate frequencies. And uh, here we have this uh, physical cell ID, which is PCI. And the donor RSSI is your um, received signal strength indicator. And uh, this one and the next one RSRP, which is your reference signal received power, kind of dictates your received signal quality. And you can see here uh, the signal at my house where I mounted the antenna in the attic is really weak. Um, and uh, the RSSI is at the seven, minus 78, 77 dBm, and the uh, donor RSRP is below 100 dBm. And RSRQ, this is your received signal quality, uh, reference signal quality, rather. And ideally, it, uh, you know, the higher the better, but uh, we're at a rather relatively low figure here. The next one is your uh, donor signal to interference plus noise ratio. And again, this is uh, not particularly high. And we have this uh, downlink transmit uh, transmitted power and uplink transmitted power. Now, these two are directly related to um, how much antenna separation you have. So in my case, the maximum transmission power is actually not that high. And that's because if you look down below, the echo gain here, uh, which we'll come back a little later, is not ideal. So one thing interesting to see is this up, uplink safe mode gain. And uh, if you recall, this unit is capable of 100 decibel gain. But here, the, up, the safe gain is capped at 92 decibels. And the reason for that is this unit is smart enough to know how far your base station is. In my case, this base station, as I mentioned earlier, is only two miles from my house. So it's relatively close. And uh, so basically this unit caps your maximum transmission power so that it does not overwhelm the base station. And then you can see the download, uh, sorry, and then you can see the downlink system gain at 77 decibels and uplink system gain at 62 decibels. So as I just mentioned why I suspect my transmission power is not close to the maximum that uh, it can have, is the separation here. So you see this two downlink echo gain and up, uplink echo gain. Ideally, these two numbers should be uh, relatively small. In fact, they should be negative. But uh, for my case, the download echo gain is at 10 decibels, which is actually really not ideal. This is because the antenna for receiving the signal is too close to my broadcast antenna, which is installed uh, just upstairs on the first floor. And uh, ideally, you wanted to install your outdoor antenna on the mask taller than you know your house, so that it, the this figure would be lower. But I find that installing the antenna in my attic is more convenient, at least in, in my situation. So, and of course, the, uh, the overall performance is, is well above my expectation, even given right now with the limited gain here. So actually right now I'm not picking up the number two, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very weak station. So you can see that it's not being picked up as it's still scanning. And uh, anyway, so that's kind of a what this page tells you. And going down here, it tells you the device state, and it can tell you the temperature, 
and software version. So again, you know, it has a lot of information that you can get from this application here. And of course, right now the system had booted up, so you can see we again have four bars. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed the video and learned something new. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe, share, and I will catch up with you next time.